Before we turn to our main presentation on spicebush and red chokeberry, with Leslie and Elizabeth, our guest gardener, Kathleen, is going to tell us about a perennial with an attractive foliage and bell-shaped flowers growing in zone seven, Hukra. It will provide multi-seasonal interest for your garden. Over to you, Kathleen. Linda, Hukra is native to North America and there's at least 36 species known. Since the 1980s, many hybrids have been formed from Hukura. It's primarily grown for its foliage and it is of course a herbaceous perennial. It puts out new leaves sometimes twice a year in the springtime when the growing season starts and also sometimes in August. It's not especially known for its flowers and it's been hybridized to produce many types of leaf colors. Leaves of hybrid plants are available in an expanded variety of colors, including green and violet, purple, maroon, bronze, orange, yellow, yellow, red, and often with streaked or mottled variation in the leaves and bold contrasting veins. The flowers of the hybrid plants include various shades of pink, coral, white, and red. The foliage is certainly gorgeous. What are some of the growing characteristics of this native plant? Hukura uh, likes to grow in a mounded form, as you can see from the pictures here. It blooms in summer, early to late, depending on the particular hybrid variety. They have delicate flowers that are sometimes on stalks as tall as 36 inches. The fluorescence of Hukura can be insignificant or even spectacular, especially if you have a mass planting of them. When many stalks come out, it can be really impressive. The flowering I learned can vary from one year to the next, and I suspect that has to do with the winter. This is actually an evergreen plant. The leaves will uh, remain through the winter. The name Hukura refers to the tiny flowers that resemble church bells. This is a shade loving plant. So, and it might actually be the ideal plant for shade. It prefers four hours or less of sunlight and a good place to plant it can be under a tree or in a rock garden. In the natural environment, they tend to grow in rocky places. Um, the, the mounding growth has a central woody stalk from which the leaves emerge. The leaves do sometimes get ragged over the winter or they might die away in harsher winters. You know what Virginia winters are like. Sometimes we get snow and very harsh temperatures and then they're likely to die away. But being a perennial, it will come back in the spring. The typical height might be a foot tall by 30 inches wide. So they're broader than they are tall, in other words. This plant might indeed be the perfect plant for shade because it's generally low maintenance. It provides multi-season interest with those leaves that tend to last spring through fall. And there are many varieties that grow in common garden soil. It does need some amendment to our clay because it doesn't like to be in wet, heavy soil. Once established, they're drought tolerant. And like I just mentioned, they don't like to be wet, so they need decent drainage and they're deer resistant. So here it is, the perfect plant for shade. <laughs> <laughs> and they're generally easy care and disease free. Oh, and I did wanna mention the small flowers do attract small bees. And this plant can prevent water erosion because of the multiplicity, multiplicity of all those leaves preventing heavy rain from hitting the ground directly can help prevent the soil from eroding away. Those sound like the perfect shade plant. Could you share with us some design tips when growing coral bell? Sure. Um, it's recommended that you divide it in early spring and I'm suspecting they mean before it really starts into its growth for that year. Um, mass plantings, which you're seeing here in the photo, offer a possibility of intensifying the flowers that do emerge on those stalks. 
So that's that's one possibility for designing with Bukera. And finally, I want to mention that the foliage is susceptible to sun and will at times bleach out. So you want to be careful not to plant in too much sun. And also the foliage does transition in color across the growing season. And I'm sorry, I don't have a slide demonstrating that. Um, but you know, the, like um, I have, I have uh, Japanese painted fern and that comes out kind of more green and turns more silvery. And this plant can do a similar thing. It can come out a lighter color and get darker or vice versa. So it's, it's a modest transition, but if you're really concerned about color when you're designing your gar garden, you might wanna keep that in mind. Um, a lot of my research came from Mount, Cuban, Mount Cuba Center, which is up in Delaware. They evaluated 83 different cultivars of Bucara back in over a three year period from 2012 to 2014. And they came up with the 10 most highly recommended varieties. And if you'd like, I can share those. Why don't you? Okay, the top 10 cultivars that stood out as top performer, performers, meaning that they also did well, they survived and they thrived and they did very well. These include something called citronella, citronelle, which is yellow, bronze wave, Cajun fire, color dream, steel city, caramel, apple crisp, frosted violet, Southern Comfort and Spellbound. Wow, those are great names. They probably look about uh, what the foliage looks like, I would assume. Mm -hmm. um, yes. And Kathleen, I see that we just had, um, we had um, a um, question that was just submitted from registration and I believe I saw uh, Joanna just uh, come online. Are you online? Oh, yes, uh, I am. Hi, thanks. Hi, hi. Um, let's, um, Kath Kathleen is going, I'm going to ask Kathleen the question and she's going to give you a response. So you asked, I have several hookahs in my shade garden. What do I need to do in the fall and winter to ensure healthy? blooming for next year. And Kathleen, do you have a response to that? I sure do. I think, I think the most significant thing you can do, I read two things. Um, be sure you do water them when it gets to be fall, but don't overwater because that, there is a problem with the center of stem rotting if, you get, if it gets too much water. And that's another reason to amend the soil before planting them if you can. And so they need a little bit of water, so they're not going to be dried out over the winter, but not too much. And the other thing is mulching. And again, with the central stem, it's kind of like a tree. You don't mulch right up the bark of the tree. You keep the mulch pulled away a little bit. But the idea of the mulch is to help protect and insulate the root system. And also, apparently, it, it helps a little bit with frost heaving if there's some mulch sitting on the soil and on top of the roots. And that's one thing to pay attention to for the spring, which is when frost heaving apparently is the biggest problem as the ground is warming up. If, if the plant gets pushed out of the soil because of a frost heave, you wanna pay attention to that and plant it back in. So that's basically for the health of the plant. What I understand from the study that this Mount Cuban Center did, they found that sometimes the Hukara didn't bloom real well, and I suspect it has more to do with the severity of the winter, and it's a problem we can't necessarily control. Because this plant doesn't necessarily want a lot of fertilizer. I've also read that. So it's easy care, meaning don't, don't pamper it too much. So. All right, well, thank you, Kathleen. Hopefully that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and uh, you can tune in and watch the presentation of at our YouTube site as well. Um, and here are Kathleen's um, references. She, she mentioned Mount Cuba, which is a great um, site to visit in Delaware. I highly recommend that. They have lots of uh, 
brochures, just like the ones on Hukra that are on display that you can pick up. They're fabulous kind of uh, uh, table put on your, you know, coffee table on display. So, um, and then um, also Kathleen mentioned the uh, St. Louis Botanical Gardens, which they have a wealth of information there. All right, we're going to segue to our topic uh, for today. Um, good afternoon, Leslie. Thank you for starting our conversation on these lovely native shrubs. Spice bush will be the first shrub that we'll be discussing. Could you share with us some background on this beautiful shrub? Sure. Um, again, it's native to the eastern U United States, um, and it does well in zone four to nine, so it covers a good broad area. Um, I, this is the first time I've really learned about this bush, and I'm, I'm pretty impressed with it. Um, it's one of the first to bloom in the spring, um, so you'll see the bright yellow flowers in the woods, um, or they, they actually like to grow along the edges of the woods and the creeks and um, that area too. So if you have a, a woody area of your yard, it would be a good one to plant along there. Um, and then um, it has little yellow berries and the fall it has these really beautiful yellow leaves. So uh, it's a really, it's really pretty, um, shrub to have um, like all seasons. So it, it grows six to 12 feet high and about six to 12 feet wide. So um, good, good space um, for, for growing. So. It's, a, it's a beautiful, it's so dainty and all. So are, what are the growing conditions for spiceberry? Um, so it, it will tolerate the full sun to part shade. Um, and it, it needs, um, it, it's usually found around wet areas, like bottomlands, valleys, ravines, but it can tolerate drought, um, heavy shade, clay soil, wet soil, and black walnut. So it doesn't sound terribly picky. I just think it needs a pretty decent amount of sun. Um, it's very good for erosion control. Um, it's good for your rain gardens, your native gardens and hedges. If you plant it pretty thick, it will um, form a, a pretty good hedge. Um, and it, uh, it, it has essential oils in the leaves, so the deer don't typically graze on it. Um, so oh, that's perfect. once you get it established, it will do really well. That's perfect. No deer grazing, hopefully. And it looks like it's multi-seasonal. Could you describe the spice bush flowers? Yeah, the, um, the flowers um, are a petalous, um, greenish, and they have very fragrant blooms. Um, and the blooms are along the branches. Um, so it's not like you can pick them, um, but they're really pretty to look at. Uh, out in the woods in the early winter uh, or the early spring. Um, they're dioecious, so you have a male plant and a female plant. Um, the male plant is showier than the female plant, and they tend to have more flowers on the stem. Um, and the female does need pollinators to set fruit. Um, and the, the fruit is these little red, they call them droops, uh, the little like berries with a seed in them that are about a half an inch in length and ripen in the fall. They, they start out green and they ripen to a bright red. Um, if you, you can use them, but you have, to, you have to get them before the birds get them because I think they're very tasty to the birds, so. Okay. Leslie, are there any benefits to the pollinators and wildlife? Um, yes, the, uh, oh, the, well, I'm sorry, the, I, I, I messed, um, oh, that's the okay. the leaves, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, they're, they're alternate, um, on the branch, they have a smooth margin and fine hairs along the leaf edge, um, and they're very fragrant when you crush them, um, and then they turn this lovely yellow color in the fall. All right, now let's segue. Do, are there any benefits to the pollinators or wildlife? Um, yes, there's actually um, a, a, 
butterfly that is the host plant for it's the spice bush swallowtail butterfly and also the palamedes swallowtail butterfly um, the fruit again is attractive to birds and the hedge is good for hiding small creatures such as rabbits squirrels little rodents um, and it was named the virginia native plant society wildflower of the year for 2006. Great, and you also mentioned again that deers tend to have uh, not graze on it. Right, so, right. So Leslie, you shared us uh, the benefits to wildlife. Are there any benefits um, for us? Um, yes, it's it's in the laurel family. So it's related to sassafras, avocado, bay leaf, and cinnamon. And the tissues um, are full of terpenes which um, are, are related fragrant compounds, also known as essential oils. Um, so the, the bark, twigs, leaves, and berries have been used to prepare flavoring or folk medicine. And the ground fruits, with or without seed, have been used as a substitute for allspice. Uh, and I read someplace that's cinnamon. Um, so the, the fruit oils have been used as a, a liniment, evidently. I don't claim anything on this one, so. <laughs> Could you tell us how to propagate spice bush? Yes, you propagate it by seed or soft wood cuttings. Um, if you try to grow the seed, you have to stratify it at 40 degrees Fahrenheit for four months prior to planting. Um, make sure you do not collect these in the wild. Um, you don't want to take them from the forest. Um, and if you get them from a plant nursery, make sure it wasn't collected in the wild. Um, make sure that they actually grew it from seed or um, from the softwood cuttings, so not dug up out of the woods. Very good point. All right, here are Leslie's uh, references. Are there any references that you'd like to point out to the folks online? Uh, the Virginia Native Plant Society was, it had a lot of information in it. Yeah, they, that, that is a good source of information. All right, and of course the Botanical Gardens and North Carolina State always has good information on mm -hmm. the land. So um, thank you, Leslie, for sharing the characteristics and growing conditions for spice bush. Elizabeth, welcome to our conversation and thank you for joining us as we continue our discussion on these native shrubs grown in zone seven. Elizabeth, could you share with us your fond memories of red chokeberry? My aunt used to tend some chokeberry bushes in her landscape in West Virginia. And the one thing I remember is there was always an item on her fall to-do list that said, make some jars of chokeberry jam. So that's one thing you can think about it. You have to remember she was um, a part of the depression where they wasted and wanted not. So she found chokeberries and made them into jam. Well, well, they're, they're gorgeous. Could you share with us some background information on red chokeberry? Um, it is a deciduous shrub known botanically as Aronia arbutifolia. It's native from Eastern Canada through the central states and the Eastern United States. It is native to wet and dry thickets. And it's sometimes confused with choke cherry, Prunus virginiana. And the name chokeberry refers to tart, a tart bitter fruit edible, but so sour it might make you choke. All right. So you have to choose between choke cherries or choke berries. This is our presentation today is on choke berries. All right. All right. What are the growing conditions for red choke berry? Okay. It, it grows vase shaped, multi stemmed, multi trunk. It is stiff, upright, with a fibrous root system. Basically, it's low maintenance. It needs full sun six hours a day. Um, and the best flowers and fruit come from full sunlight, maybe more than just six hours a day. It's easily grown in average medium moisture soils with a wide, wide range of soil tolerance, including boggy conditions. It blooms in fragrant cluster, clusters in May with one inch blossoms. 
All right, so they have fragrant blooms just like the spice bush does, it sounds like. Well, actually the blooms are pink. Oh. Okay. And um, in the next slide down, I will let you see what the blooms look like, but. Okay, um, all right. They are, they are very. Go ahead. Okay. Um, are we going to talk about, oh, okay. Yep. We're going to talk about Take benefits. Like the wildlife. Yes. The deer feed on the fruit. So you may end up with no berries in the fall. They're also eaten by mammals and birds. So if you intend to harvest for jam, you have to get out there early to get your berries. Pollinators are attracted to blossoms for nectar and they have no serious disease or insect problems, but can be, in, um, can be become infected with leaf spot, which I have a picture for you to see of the leaf spot. And then they, they sometimes can be subject to twig fruit blight. You have to remember that they are a fruit, fruit shrub because, they have, because of the berries. So they can be um, come infl infected with fruit blight. And over on the right, you'll see a picture of what that would look like. Thanks for sharing. Elizabeth, I'm looking for a shrub with multi-seasonal interest. Would red chokeberry be a good choice? Oh, yes, it would. It has multi-season, seasonal interest, spring, summer, fall, and winter. In the spring, you have white to pink blossoms, as you can see uh, to the right. In the summer, you have beautiful, glossy green, green leaves. And in the fall, you have pear-shaped red berries and orangish red leaves. And uh, my first slide showed some um, red leaves that come in the fall. In the winter, you have a very interesting bark, which is reddish brown. Those are gorgeous flowers. I love the, um, the pink there and the white, those contrast. And it, it's fragrant too. Yeah, wow. Um, what are some recommended landscape uses for the red chokeberry? Well, you have to remember it grows tall, six to 10 feet tall, three to six feet wide. So um, you need to make sure you have plenty of space. It's good for borders, hedges, mass planting, or privacy uh, screens. It tends to sucker and form colonies. And the spreading is good if you want it. Otherwise, you need to remember to remove the root suckers to prevent the spread. It's a good choice for a pollinator garden. And some cultivars are Brintalissima, which is compact with fragrant flute flowers, and Erecta, which has a sturdy upright shape, but less colorful blooms. Thanks for sharing those cultivars. Elizabeth, are there some ways to propagate red chokeberry? Well, um, you can propagate from seeds. You can propagate from soft wood cuttings or removing the suckers and, and potting them while the plant is dormant. You want to prune to encourage bushiness and you need to prune to prevent unruly spread. You prune after blooming, May to June, and you prune each stem or branch just above a leaf node to prevent dieback. Elizabeth, when and how should we prune ch chokeberry? Well, um, prune to encourage bushiness, prune okay. to prevent unruly spread, prune in the spring after, after May or June, after blooming, and then you prune each stem or branch just above a leaf node to prevent dieback. All right, great, thank you. All right, Elizabeth, you mentioned your Aunt May chokeberry and that the name chokeberry refers to fruit that is so sour that it might make you choke. Sounds like, <laughs> sounds like the jam may require lots of sugar. Um, the tarts are, the berries are tart and bitter. And I remember as a little girl, I tried them one time, never again. <laughs> uh, the, the berries are tart and bitter, but the jams, and jellies are thick because of the abundance of, of pectin in the berries. It needs lots of sugar to be palatable. And I did include a recipe in the, in the event you want to be a little, um, a little uh, adventurous and try some. Um, we usually had chokeberry jam at Christmas and I don't remember liking it, but the adults did. So maybe 
maybe one of you would like to be a little adventurous and try some choke berry, choke berry jam. All right, thanks for sharing that recipe. Um, here's Elizabeth's uh, references for red choke berry. Are there any references that you'd like to point out to the folks online? I really liked the North Carolina Extension Center Garden Plant Toolbox. I thought it was very informative. It had a lot more information than I was able to include in this presentation. And if you wanted to know a lot more information, that would be a very good place to go look for it. All right, and let's see. This reference uh, slide is for your images if they wanna go look there. And then I have one more slide for your images right here. Another at North Carolina. North Carolina Extension Garden Toolbox, yes. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, they're a, they're a great reference for all kinds of, especially native native uh, plants. So, um, all right. Well, well, uh, thank you, Leslie and Elizabeth, for all this great information about these beautiful shrubs growing in Zone Seven. Now let's turn to questions submitted from registration. Is Terry online today? And if so, if you can unmute. So Terry's question, she actually asked two questions she submitted. How easy is it to grow spice bush from seed or fruit? And Leslie, could you answer that question? Sure, um, you can grow it from seed if you have um, access to the fresh seeds um, from with female flowers and they have to be fertilized uh, by a male plant um, in order to form the, uh, the fruits. Um, so they're oval red droop with a single seed inside um, and it ripens in the late summer. It goes from green, um, like a greenish yellow to orange red um, and you have to collect them before the birds do because I guess they're pretty tasty to the birds. Um, you, you want to remove the fleshy red coating um, and squeeze the seed out from the, fr the fruit. Place the seeds in a plastic bag with some peat moss. It needs to be moist but not wet and refrigerate for a minimum of three to four months. Um, so it has to be 40 degrees um, or less for three to four months. Um, I guess the germination is pretty good, so you don't need a whole lot of them. Um, so don't take all the fruit, um, leave some for the birds. Um, you can also take uh, the fruit and make like a curry with it. Um, so there, you can do two things with, with that too, so. We'll segue to the next question that Terry asked. Okay. How do you dry the fruit seeds for culinary use? Um, you can use all parts of the, um, the bush. Um, you can use the thin twigs um, to, uh, to infuse and tease. Um, you can use the new leaves in, um, like to make salads um, when they just emerge and they're, and they're small. Um, you can use the flowers and twigs and vinegar to make flavored vinegar. Um, and if you, you pick the berries when they're green, they're very peppery. Um, and the, uh, when they turn red, it tastes similar to allspice. So you, you want to rinse them, um, pat them dry and chop them in a blender or a spice grinder. You can also dehydrate them um, and or freeze them and then grind them um, and use them uh, like similar to allspice or um, cinnamon in your cobblers and pies. So I guess you can also remove the seeds and use just the fruit in, in your cobblers and pies too. So it has a lot of use. Lots of great information. If Terry's mm -hmm. online, hopefully that answered uh, her two questions there. 